general seminar of the Center for Informatics and Computational Science. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Andrew Ferguson from the University of Chicago to visit us today. Um, he's a chemical engineer, but he's a scientist by training, uh, graduated from Imperial College. Let's see if I remember all the sequence. Uh, PhD at Princeton, uh, postdoc at MIT. Uh, Early career as an assistant professor at the University of Illinois at Banner Champaign, where he was in the material science department. And very recently, a few months ago, he moved to a new uh, department, start SLAS Institute at the University of Chicago called uh, Institute for Molecular Engineering. Sorry, molecular Engineering. All right, so we have way to go. Institute of Molecular Engineering. Uh, so he will be talking today on machine learning, collective variable discovery for materials design and engineering. Great, thanks very much, Nicholas. So uh, thanks very much uh, for being here and for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here to tell you a little bit about the work that, that we're doing in, a, in our group in machine learning and sort of soft materials uh, engineering. Um, so I thought I'd start with this paper. Uh, so this is a 1959 paper by uh, Eugene Wigner, famous, uh, famous mathematician, where he talks about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and natural sciences. So the gist of the paper is sort of, you know, you, mathematics uh, from one field has vast applicability in others. The example he takes in the, in the first page is sort of the geometry of the circle. Pi appears, but it also has uh, utility in statistics and modeling sort of Gaussian distributions. Um, and so, you know, the discoveries in one area can have massive implications in, in, in another. So, so mathematics is ubiquitous and powerful. Um, and so 50 years later, this, uh, this paper came out uh, by uh, Peter Norvig and, and collaborators. Peter Norvig is one of the, uh, the machine learning guys uh, out at Google, um, who make this sort of uh, statement that we should stop acting as if our goal is to author extremely elegant theories and instead embrace complexity and make use of the best ally we have, uh, the unreasonable effectiveness of data. So sort of starting to riff on, on Eugene Wigner's title. Um, and so at this point, if you're a theorist, you should be booing and be, be very angry that this is, this is the case, that we, we should not use theory and we should, we should use data. And in fact, you may be so angry, you may, you may be feeling like this. Um, so of course, this is uh, Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction riffing on his, uh, his, his famous line. And so I don't completely agree with the statement in, in Norvig's paper, uh, and so I don't think we should be abandoning theory, but I think absolutely agree we should be embracing data. And so what should we be doing? We should be using data to help us along the way. So we should be using data to help guide us in the right direction, help us traver traverse very large search spaces, um, and improve our ability to sort of uh, negotiate materials data sets in an effective manner. Um, and so today I thought I'd tell you a couple of stories from our group where we're trying to do, 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 use these types of ideas, where we're using data science techniques, machine learning techniques in the context of materials engineering to help navigate large search spaces, help us design uh, collides to self-assemble into particular crystalline structures, um, and help us accelerate molecular dynamic simulations. Um, okay, so let me tell you about the, this first story. So this is really motivated by soft materials engineering. So the idea is that you would like to design some high functional materials, so materials with particular structure or function. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is through uh, self-assembly. And so top-down processing techniques is, is uh, sort of fraught with difficulty for sort of nano-scale uh, materials. And so one way of, uh, of, of assembling these things is by designing building blocks with particular architectures and chemistries such that they will spontaneously assemble materials with the desired functionality you wish. And so how do we design these building blocks with just the right uh, details such that we can program them to assemble materials with the desired structure and function? And so of course to do that, you need to uh, encounter both, uh, engage both the thermodynamic stability and and kinetic assembly mechanisms. So you need to be able to get there and you need to be stable. And so how can we sort of uh, figure out what should go in this green box in order to basically um, execute this inverse design procedure? And so one way of doing this is, is through assembly landscapes. And so if you're familiar with protein folding, uh, maybe, maybe the concept of protein folding landscapes is familiar to you, which is basically a landscape that ma maps out the configurational phase space that the protein can live in as a function of its free energy. And so the, the peaks and valleys are sort of the, the unstable and the stable configurations. And these, uh, these axes basically map out the protein as it's sort of moving around its configurational space. So an assembly landscape is just a many-body generalization of this, where your coordinates are some, uh, some descriptors that describe how the system is arranged in space, these many-body uh, interactions between the building blocks. Um, and so this is a powerful lens for understanding and design because it embeds both the thermodynamics, and so, so the, the unstable and the stable configurations, and if you pick your variables correctly, the dynamics, and so the assembly pathways by which you get from one metastable state to another. And so in order to be useful, uh, you have to have the correct variables on the axes. And so basically, how do you find good variables with which to parameterize your system to describe the locations and the interactions between these many building blocks as they're self-assembling into the material that you care about? 
And so one way of finding these is to use ideas from data science or machine learning. And so the particular variant of machine learning that's, that's uh, opportune here is manifold learning. And so, okay, so what's manifold learning? And so basically it's the idea if you have a high dimensional phase space, in our case, it's gonna be the coordinates of all of the building blocks in our system as they're sort of rotating and translating through space. That's a very high dimensional data set. Every one of your N building blocks has three degrees of freedom, sort of XYZ Cartesian coordinates, plus maybe some internal degrees of freedom. So it maps out this high dimensional space. And that, that's the space in which Newton's equations of motion uh, are formulated and your system is actually uh, self-assembling. But of course, because there's couplings between the degrees of freedom, your effective dimensionality of the system is much lower than your ambient dimensionality. So that's to say there is some low dimensional sort of emergent simplicity because these building blocks are interacting with one another. They're not ideal gases. Um, and, and so perhaps you can think about this geometrically as a low dimensional intrinsic manifold. So can we find good variables with which to parameterize this manifold that tell us something about how we should be parameterizing our system? So this is just an example of the, the so-called Swiss roll data set. And so humans are very bad at visualizing high dimensional spaces. So this is a 2D uh, manifold living in a 3D space. But of course the analog is that you have sort of a low dimensional manifold living in a 3N dimensional space. And so the idea is how do we discover that systematically? Um, okay, so, so perhaps you prefer to think about this temporally, in, in which case you can think about this in sort of the Maurice Zwanzig projector operator formalism, that there are a few slow degrees of freedom that sort of govern the long-term evolution of the system to which the sort of the remaining fast degrees of freedom are slaved as effective noise. And so either way is useful of thinking about. Uh, we tend to prefer the geometric one. Um, okay, so how do you find that this is really a two-dimensional object living in this higher dimensional space? And so we use nonlinear manifold learning techniques. And so if you're familiar with principal components analysis or multidimensional scaling, those are basically linear manifold learning techniques. They find the linear directions or the, the linear combinations of your input variables that describe the maximum variance in your data. Nonlinear manifold learning techniques are nothing more than nonlinear gen generalizations of those. So they're able to deal with curvy manifolds. So for example, PCA would fa fail very badly on this manifold Manifold, but a nonlinear technique would be able to sort of uh, map out the curvilinear structure. Um, okay, so we're going to use nonlinear manifold learning to give us these good variables with which to build our free energy landscapes, and that's going to tell us how the material is assembling and what its stability is. Okay, so that's sort of the forward problem. The reverse problem is then how do you design the material to sort of have the structure and the function that you care about? And so basically we're gonna ask genetic algorithms to sort of modulate this landscape to stabilize the materials that we care about by changing the properties of the building blocks. So these are the two ingredients that we're gonna use. So let me describe the first one first. So how do we actually find these manifolds? And then how do we use the genetic algorithms to solve this inverse design problem? Um, okay, so the particular variant of manifold learning that we use are, is called diffusion maps. And so there are various uh, incarnations of nonlinear manifold learning, locally linear embedding, Hessian eigenmaps, um, and, and a large number of others. We like this one because it's relatively simple to apply. It actually just depends on linear algebra, despite the fact it's a nonlinear technique. And it has some firm mathematical footing with some nice uh, provable properties. Um, okay, so how does this work? So you have n observations of your system in this high m dimensional space. So um, you can think about this as your molecular dynamics or your Brownian dynamics trajectory that's recording the coordinates of all of your building blocks as a function of time, whether these are colloids or peptides or, or whatever you wish. So you'd like to embed these n observations in a lower k dimensional space. That's trying to find that curvy manifold I showed you on the last slide. In that case, that was a two dimensional data set. So k would be equal to two. So how do you find this in a systematic way? So diffusion map says do the following. It says construct a random walk over your high dimensional data set. So ask every point how far it is from all of its neighbors. And so this is a, a pairwise distance between snapshots and your molecular dynamics trajectory. Um, okay, so if you have a protein, which is a single molecule, maybe you measure the root mean squared deviation between two protein configurations. When you have a high dimensional system with many building blocks that are identical, sort of moving through space, how do you define that distance? And I'll tell you that on the, on the next slide. Um, okay, so that's a way of measuring how different different configurations of your system are. You then co convolute that with a Gaussian kernel, and that just tells you these unnormalized hopping probabilities. You're just saying you have a higher chance of hopping to configurations that are close by than you are from hopping to configurations that are far away. So this is defining some locality in your, in your random walk. You then normalize these unnormalized hopping probabilities, and you get a Markov matrix. This describes your random walk over your high dimensional data set. Then all that you do is do a spectral decomposition. You just find the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors, and these eigenvectors give you the good collective variables with which to parameterize your, your, your low dimensional um, projection. So why is this a useful thing to do? Well, these things are the slowest modes of your random walk. So if I go back one slide, 
Basically, the first mode of this random walk would tell you this is the slowest mode to move along this curvilinear manifold. The second slowest mode is to move perpendicular to it. And then you get a gap in your eigenvalue spectrum that tells you everybody else is fast. And so this is a good way of telling you what are the slow motions you need to uh, preserve to parameterize your data correctly. Separate out the metastable states, map out the slow assembly pathways, and give you good support with which to build your free energy surface. Um, OK, so then you do nothing more than embed your data into these eigenvectors. So this is a so-called diffusion mapping. Um, and there's some provably beautiful theorems about this diffusion mapping, mainly due to uh, Rafi Kaufman at Yale. Uh, the most important one for us, which is to say that diffusion distances in your original space, so how hard it is for one configuration to transform into another, map to Euclidean distances in your, in your uh, low dimensional embedding. So things that are easy to transform, so there are a large number of short kinetic pathways between them, get embedded close together. Things that are hard to transform, you need to do a lot of work on the system where it takes a long time to get from one configuration to another are embedded far apart. So this preserves some sort of dynamic interpretability. So that's why these assembly landscapes are both thermodynamically relevant because you're mapping out free energies and dynamically relevant because you're, you're sort of uh, uh, engaging the slow dynamical motions of your system. Um, OK, so, so, so how do we do this? So we're looking at self-assembly. So we run our molecular simulations or our Brownian dynamic simulations. Um, and you can watch these things assemble. So in this case, they're assembling into these nice uh, icosahedra. And then you have to measure distances between these different self-assembled aggregates. So, so how do you do that? So one convenient way to do that is to map them out as interaction graphs. So here I've pulled out one particular aggregate. This is a perfect icosahedron. Here's this interaction graph. So each node is a building block, and each edge is an interaction. So all of these things are interacting uh, with their nearest neighbors because they're, they're either geometrically or energetically close. And that defines a graph. This guy's a tetramer, so it has this graph. Uh, this guy's a hexamer, it has this graph. And now you can measure distances between these self-assembled clusters in a rigorous way through graph matching. So basically, how much rewiring do you need to do of the graph to change one cluster into another? So this is a convenient way of measuring distances between self-assembled objects. And that's what we feed into the diffusion map. So the diffusion map then gives us our low dimensional uh, variables in which to build our free energy landscapes. And these are nothing more than sort of uh, negative logarithms of probabilities. And so if you have a high probability, you're going to be uh, down in this free energy well here. If you have a low probability, you're up here in this peak. And so this is mapping out the metastable states and the pathways connecting them. OK, so that's how, how we uh, recover the landscapes. How do we then do the second part, which is to say, OK, I have a landscape corresponding to one particular building block. How should I change the properties of my building block to make that landscape more like I want it to be? I should stabilize the structures, the self-assembled materials that I care about. So we're going to use genetic algorithms to do this. And so given these landscapes, this provides us a powerful way to do the inverse design because we can ask the landscape to sort of change its morphology, to sort of stabilize. Uh, per perhaps you want to stabilize this structure to so make this free energy well really deep, destabilize this structure because we want to push the, the system away from this and push it into this, this free energy minimum. So you can define a number of objective functions over this landscape, the simplest of which perhaps is the following. You want to um, sort of maximize the distance between the free energy of your target structure and the free energy of its next competitor. So that's to say, let's find the, the, the free energy of the well that we care about, our target free energy well. Let's find the free energy of its nearest competitor, and let's make that gap as large as possible. And so that's going to stabilize the thing that we want, destabilize the things that we don't want. You can think of more complex objective functions, maybe minimum action pathways, uh, fancier things. But this one is a pretty generic one that, that works quite well. And although it's a purely thermodynamic metric, because you're actually changing the overall global topography of your manifold, um, it actually also affects the kinetics, which I will show you also. Um, OK, so, so given our objective function, then how do we run our genetic algorithm? So we pick a bunch of uh, initial candidates. So these are patchy colloids, or this is what I'm going to tell you about, which are basically sort of micron-sized colloids with sticky patches on them. And so these sticky patches are specific. Um, and so the red sticks to red, and blue sticks to blue. And you can think about this uh, as sort of uh, being functionalized with DLA, DNA oligos, if you wish. And so these are specific um, uh, interactions between these, these sticky patches. Um, OK, so you, so you pick a, a bunch of these that you think might be reasonable candidates. You find their assembly landscapes, and you measure the objective function for each one of those candidates. So this is generation one. Here's the fitness of each one of these candidates uh, according to our, our metric delta beta f, which is this gap. And then you say, OK, who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? 
make the genetic algorithm move us more towards the good ones. And so here's our design space, where in this case it's phi b and phi c, which is just the angles of these things. So find the ones that are good, use those to seed the next generation of candidates through this genetic sort of uh, crossover algorithm where you apply mutations and crossbreeding to seed your next generation. So here's generation two. And then you just move along this generations until you converge. And so basically you can think about this in the following flow diagram. You have some initial building blocks. They may not be particularly good ones. You can sample their fitness landscapes. You can run the genetic algorithm and ask if you've converged. And so if you've not converged, i.e. you've not sort of reached some, some global optimum, you re-perturb your building blocks through this GA and just keep moving around this loop until, until you reach convergence. And that will give you your final building blocks. So basically what we're asking the, the machine learning or the genetic algorithm to do is change the building block design in a principled manner to make the landscape look more like we want it to, to stabilize the materials that we care about with the structure or the function that we want. Okay, so let me give you an example of this. So we've used this to assemble sort of uh, polyhedra into structures that we care about. So things like uh, icosahedra and capsulins that look like viral capsids, or perhaps octahedral clusters, all of the platonic solids. Very recently, we've actually applied this to infinite aggregates, i.e. crystals. And so, so why on earth would you want to make a colloidal crystal? So colloidal crystals turn out to have this, uh, this beautiful property that they're just of the right length scale. And if you can make them assemble particular crystal morphologies with open architectures, they possess omnidirectional band gaps at visible frequencies. So, so why is this valuable? Well, it turns out that photonic crystals are to photons what semiconductors are to electrons. And so if you can design photonic crystals with omnidirectional band gaps, meaning three-dimensional band gaps in visible frequencies, you can use them as sort of waveguides for light. And this is a, an enabling technology for sort of optical computing. And so there's a lot of interest in synthesizing these things. So what's the problem with these? So it turns out that we possess 1 and 2D photonic crystals. We know how to make these pretty well. 3D photonic crystals are challenging. Why? Because the 3D photonic crystal architectures are very open architectures with very low atomic packing fractions. So these things do not occur naturally. They're just two open lattices uh, to, to sort of generate using simple sort of hard spheres or sticky spheres. So you really need directional interactions to synthesize these things. And it's very unclear how to have robust directional interactions that will make these with high fidelity. So here's a couple of examples of photonic crystals, the, the canonical diamond lattice, and it's inverse, in which case if you put tetrahedra within all the gaps of the diamond lattice, you wind up with the pyrochlor lattice. This is the one I'm going to be talking about today. So it turns out this pyrochlor lattice has this band gap at optical frequencies, and it turns out you don't need a very large um, uh, sort of refractive index difference, sort of a dielectric contrast, between your uh, colloids and your matrix, which is typically air. So it turns out even with, with just uh, 3.14, uh, 3.41, which is for, for silicon, or maybe a little bit larger for other materials, you can open up a band gap very easily. So these are nice uh, systems that, that have desirable properties. The question is, how do you assemble them? So can we use our inverse design procedure to tell us how do we place directional interactions on these spheres in order to assemble these open lattices? Okay, so if we look at the pyrochlor lattice, um, it turns out that the fundamental motif is a staggered, staggered tetrahedron. And so if you look at a particular particle and you look above, you will see that it has three neighbors in this sort of triangular uh, configuration. So this guy forms a tetrahedron. If you look below it, it also has these three neighbors in this uh, tetrahedral configuration. But this, tet this uh, set of three is staggered from this set of three. And so they're sort of um, moved by 60 degrees. And so this is the fundamental motif you need to assemble the pyrochlor lattice. You need the guys above you to be staggered by 60 degrees from the guys below you. So how do you, form, uh, how, how do you design particles that, that will have that behavior? Well, the simplest way to do this is to assign each particle three sticky patches on its north pole and its south pole that are staggered by 30 degrees. So here's the north pole. Here are your blue sticky patches. Patches. This gray sphere is translucent, so you can see through it. Here's your south pole with these three sticky patches. So that will give rise to, the, to this architecture. So then the question is, where should you place these patches, and how sticky should they be in order to assemble the pyrochlor lattice? And so it turns out they should not actually be directly on what you would believe should be the platonic ideal locations. You need a little bit of plasticity there to account for entropic effects, and you also need to worry about um, healing defects in your pyrochlor lattice. So if you just design these patches and run the assembly, you typically end up with mess. And so the way to actually get this is a little more subtle. Okay, so here's the idea. We use our inverse design to um, sort of engineer a two-stage hierarchical assembly procedure. So what do we do? Okay, so the patches are gonna look like they're, they're, they're sort of a sticky patch on the North Pole, there's a sticky patch on the South Pole. We're gonna make the North Pole a little more sticky than the South Pole, so why would we want to do that? So it allows us to do a high temperature assembly where the sticky North Poles form these tetrahedra. And then it allows us to do 
a low temperature uh, assembly where the south poles then become uh, thermally active and they ca can assemble the uh, opposing tetrahedra, the staggered tetrahedra. So this thermally decouples these two things and allows us to make a monodispersed mixture of tetrahedra that subsequently assemble into our pyrochlor lattice. And this is not a new idea, it's sort of a two-stage assembly hierarchy and it makes sure we don't incorporate too many defects. And so it allows us to make these things perfectly in the first stage and then assemble them very slowly under a temperature ramp so that the, the particles have enough energy to heal defects to make our pyrochlor lattice. Okay, so how should we engage this, this, this uh, design problem? So, okay, so this is just what I wanted to point out. So here's an example of the staggered tetrahedron. So if you look at this middle particle here, upstairs you have this triangle where it's pointing sort of towards you, downstairs you have this triangle that's pointing away from you. So this is a fundamental motif. We're going to ask our landscape engineering architecture to, 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 to sort of figure out for us by stabilizing the tetrahedral motif. Okay, so here's an example of this, uh, of this optimization procedure. So we did exactly what, what I described. We, we find our landscapes, we run this inverse design procedure, and we run it for a number of generations until we converge. So what am I showing you here? So I'm showing you two different spaces. So up here is our optimization space. So what are we optimizing? We're optimizing the angle and the strength of the interaction of the North Pole. So if I go back one... We're optimizing the angle and the strength of the interaction of the patches on the North Pole. So basically, where do we place these patches and how sticky should they be? So we're just worrying about one pole right now because we just want to make this high temperature assembly. So how do we stabilize this guy to form tetrahedra at this high temperature? Okay, so we start with an initial set of candidates. The black dots are our candidates, and so they're dispersed all over this design space. So different degrees of stickiness, different angles at which we're placing these patches are all over the place. And here's our objective function, the stability of the target structure, this tetrahedron, relative to its nearest competitor. So these things are typically green and yellow, which is relatively high, so it's a bad uh, value of this fitness function. We want to push things towards blue. What am I showing you down here? This is an example of the assembly landscape for the fittest candidate in that generation. So these guys are the eigenvectors that came out of the diffusion map. So these are collective variables in which we build our free energy landscape. And then I'm showing you the free energy landscape. And so here's our monomers. They have a particular uh, free energy. Here's our dimers. They have a particular free energy, trimers, tetramers, uh, and pentamers. So it turns out that the Tetramers are not the global free energy minimum, so it's a relatively bad initial design. But that's okay. We asked the genetic algorithm to say, what are the best guys from this generation? Let's seed them, use them to seed the next generation and repeat this procedure. So by generation five, things have got a little better. So you can see that the distribution of candidates is now a little bit tighter. So this, uh, this oval is just showing the two principal axes of this distribution. It's starting to tighten up. It's starting to move towards this region of space. Things are a little bluer, so things are a little fitter. And here's the free energy landscape for the fittest candidate in this generation. So these eigenvectors are totally distinct from these ones because it was, it was designed for, for a new generation. So the diffusion map operates only within a single generation. And now we can see that the tetrahedra are a little more stable relative to all of the competing oligomers. So this, is, this is an improved design. Okay, then by generation 15, we converge. So how do we decide we converge? Well, basically, we're within 1 kT within energy space and within 1 degree within the, the patch angle. So uh, this is our criterion for convergence. The distribution is now very tight. The fittest candidate from this generation has sort of uh, moved towards this, this very tightly distributed region of space here in our design space. And you can see that the, uh, the tetramers are now overwhelmingly the most stable configuration. We've actually completely destabilized the trimers, dimers, and monomers within the resolution of our sampling, and the only competitor are these pentamers, which are much less stable than, than these uh, tetramers. So the inverse design procedure has told us exactly how we should make the patches placed and sticky to favor the assemble of tetrahedra over all competing aggregates. Okay, so here's the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, optimization time course. So starting from generation one, we had our initial guess. We have high variance in this initial guess because we had many, many candidates. And as you run through to generation 15, this thing oscillates for a while and then converges to around 15.5 degrees. And so this is where you should place your patches. Um, excuse me, 15.5 kT. And so that's how sticky you should make your patches. Uh, 5B is, is, is the patch placement. And so it turns out you should put them at about 30.5 degrees, which is not exactly where you should anticipate you would put them just based on geometric constraints. And so the optimizer um, also accounts for the, the entropic, uh, entropic forces in, in this optimization because, of course, this is a free energy, not just a potential energy. And so that's baked into the way that we place our patches. Okay, so this told us that in order to assemble tetrahedra at this high temperature, which is a reduced temperature of 0.8, this is how you sticky you should make the guys, and this is the angle at which you should place them. <laughs> 
So that's good. And so we can run high temperature assembly and make tetrahedra with high fidelity. So we've stabilized the, the formation of these tetrahedra. But I said I want to also do the second stage of the hierarchical assembly uh, and, and form pyrochlor lattice from these tetrahedral building blocks. So how do we uh, convince our, our inverse design procedure to do that for us? So it turns out we actually don't need to do anything new. We can just sort of extrapolate the results for the North Pole to the South Pole, because all we want to do is also make tetrahedra. But it turns out all we want to do is make them in a staggered orientation. So you just move your patches round by 60 degrees without changing the, the angle phi b. So here they're still at 30.5 degrees. They're just rotated around the azimuth angle by 60 degrees. And how sticky you should make them? Well, you just extrapolate to the low temperature at which you want to form uh, your assemblies. And so instead of being at 0.8, you're at 0.3. So you just rescale the stickiness of your interactions accordingly. And so actually, we don't need to run a new round of inverse design. We just use our high temperature results and extrapolate to low temperature. OK, so the idea is we've stabilized this intermediate motif, and then we believe that we can then use that as a building block to assemble the, the final pyrochlor lattice. OK, so does this work? So let me show you, uh, first of all, the high temperature assemblies. This is stage one of assembly. Here's the initially uh, monodispersed distribution of these, uh, these patchy particles with the design that the inverse uh, design algorithm told us to use. And then we run our Browning dynamics simulation. Actually, it's Langevin dynamics. And we see that we assemble uh, monodispersed tetrahedra. So it's actually worked very, very well. So here's the pair correlation function of the tetrahedral centers in, in, in the terminal frame. So you can see that basically you have a small peak here. But basically, you're an ideal gas of tetrahedra. And so there's very little structure. So this is good. It's telling us that the north poles are causing these guys to assemble at this high temperature. But the south poles, because they're thermally decoupled, they're very unsticky at this high temperature. Are not causing these things to aggregate and make sort of messes with, with, with imperfections. It's really just a monodispersed mixture of tetrahedra. So then we use this simulation, and then we apply a temperature ramp. So now we're going to slowly ramp the temperature from our high temperature and reduce units of 0.8 down to 0.3. So we do this over the course of 5 times 10 to the 8 steps. And so it's very slow ramping, which gives the system plenty of time to sort of rearrange and heal defects. So here's this temperature ramp where we slowly ramp down to this low temperature. And so we start with our monodispersed tetrahedra. These guys move around in space. And then eventually, you'll see at the back of the box, this pyrochlor lattice is going to nucleate. And then all the system is going to collapse into this near perfect pyrolor, uh, pyrochlor lattice. So then the, uh, the movie is going to circulate round. And so you can see that this is the pyrochlor down here. Uh, we actually have a grain boundary up here. So you'll see these guys are dimers, not tetramers. So the thing is, is not a perfect lattice. Uh, but down here, it, it, it's a very high fidelity pyrochlor lattice. And so we check that by looking at the pair correlation function. And so um, these delta functions in orange are the peaks of the ideal pyrochlor lattice. In blue are our, uh, the results from our last frame of our simulation. So all the peaks are in exactly the right places. And here we have the, uh, the Q4 parameter, which is the Steinhardt bond order parameter for, of the fourth order. And so if we were an ideal pyrochlor lattice, this should be centered around 0 0.02, and it is. And so our Gaussian distribution lies there. This little shoulder here is essentially just finite size effects. And so it's because we, we don't have an infinite lattice, we have sort of edges to our pyrochlor. And so, so, so we understand where this is coming from. And so this inverse design procedure has told us how to design a building block to stabilize the formation of this photonic crystal. And so we think this is a nice, interesting result. It provides a, a prescription to sort of design and interactions on this uh, colloidal building block to assemble this useful photonic crystal. And so we're taking this now to, uh, in a couple different directions. And so we'd like to design also the diamond lattice, which means that we'd like to uh, design a tetramer end and a dimer end. And so now we'll, we'll be able to assemble diamond if, we, if we're able to do that. And also check the robustness of this. So this is a monodispersed design. And so all of our designs have exactly 15.5 kTs of stickiness and 30.5 degrees of angle. Of course, when you're making these things experimentally, you're going to have some polydispersity. So how robust are we to polydispersity is going to be a really important thing to try and engage here. Um, OK, but those are easy things to bake into our design protocol. You just uh, apply some dispersity to, to, your, uh, to your genetic algorithm. Um, OK, so, so with that, I'd like to sort of move on to, to the second story, which is uh, also using some machine learning techniques, but, but a completely different machine learning techniques to try and accelerate uh, uh, molecular simulations. OK, so, so what are we doing in this space? So the idea here is that um, it really goes back to, to this idea of, of, uh, of uh, Martin Karplus's 1990 paper <laughs> with uh, Greg Petsko, that in molecular dynamic simulations, we basically suffer from two limitations. So there are systematic errors um, due to the, uh, the, the potential energy functions, i.e. the force fields. And there are uh, statistical errors due to sampling. 
And so this means that our force fields are not perfect. That introduces uh, some systematic errors. And you have to run your simulation long enough to get converged thermodynamic averages. And unless you run for the age of the universe, you're not going to make sure that you're converged. And so we have uh, sort of configurational sampling problems. And so this paper from 1990 is equally true today. We're still grappling with both of these issues. And so what I'd like to tell you about today is some ways that we're trying to think about improving the, the second one. So how do we do a better job of sampling configurational space uh, with the finite computational resources that we have? So this is an old problem, and so, so we know a number of ways of doing this. Um, so we can use accelerated sampling. We don't just run unbiased molecular dynamics that evolve according to Newton's equations of motion. We perturb the equations of motion to allow us to do a better job of sampling space. We push the system around its, its phase space uh, to try and do a better job of sampling, a, a better job of getting converged thermodynamic averages. So there are basically two classes of ways of doing that. Tempering techniques, which seek to modify the temperature or the Hamiltonian of your system in order to improve sampling. So basically you want to modify the Hamiltonian such that your energy barriers are lower and you can push the system around more easily. The other way of doing things is to sort of leave the Hamiltonian intact, but shove the system around with some artificial biasing forces. So you push it around uh, with some artificial potentials that help you move through the phase space and do a better job of sampling. And so these are basically collective variable biasing techniques. You need to define some good collective variables in which you sort of accelerate your system. And so there are a number of ways of doing this. The oldest one is sort of perhaps umbrella sampling. Um, there are various uh, fancier flavors of this, so method dynamics, which is one that uh, Professor Whitmer works on uh, a lot. But the big question with this is, how do you define good collective variables in which to design your sampling algorithms? And so how do you find good directions in which to apply your artificial biasing forces? If you pick bad collective variables, uh, then you do a terrible job and you're just wasting a bunch of computation. And for all but the simplest systems, it's very hard to intuit what is a good collective variable. And so can machine learning help tell us what good collective variables are and then use these collective variables to apply biasing potentials and do a better job of sampling configurational space? OK, so there are many ways of finding collective variables. And so, so um, wh wh what sort of properties should they have? And so good collective variables should separate out the metastable states of the system. So you want to do a good job of doing that. They should characterize the, the slow configurational motion. So they should characterize the dynamics of the system. And so, so far, what I've told you, diffusion maps seem to be a good candidate. And so, so what I showed you in the previous part of the talk was that diffusion maps are very good at doing that. Where do diffusion maps fall down? They're not explicit differentiable functions of your input coordinates. So that's to say, if I run a diffusion map on your molecular system, I can get some low dimensional embedding, but I don't know how to write down an explicit expression taking the atomic coordinates to your collective variable space. So why is that a big deal? Well, you need that explicit expression to propagate biases to the atomic, uh, to the, to atomic forces. So if you write down a biasing potential within your collective variables to shove the system along these collective variables, you need to propagate that force back to the, the atoms in your system to run your molecular the dynamic simulation. So if you don't have that explicit differentiable mapping, you can't do that. OK, so, so, so we really need that in order to, to, to be useful. So OK, well, well, one class of methods that does have that explicit uh, mapping are linear dimensionality reduction techniques. So principal components analysis, multidimensional scaling, they do have that explicit mapping. In that respect, they're very good. However, they don't do such a good job in the first two criteria. Nonlinear dimensionality reduction techniques such as diffusion maps, isomap, lo locally linear embedding, again, they do well on the first two, they fall down on the third. So what is the technique that allows us to hit all three of these criteria simultaneously? So it turns out that deep neural networks, or actually this is the shallowest variant of deep neural networks, but autoencoding neural networks are one way of doing this. They, they allow you to hit all three of these criteria and provide a useful way of finding good collective variables that you can then do direct, uh, do enhanced sampling directly within those variables. Um, OK, so, so to my knowledge, it's one of the only, or in fact the only, nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique that gives you this explicit differentiable mapping between your collective variables and your input coordinates, in this case atomic coordinates. So it's very fashionable. Deep learning is, 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 is sort of a, a nice technique to use in many places. This is the reason we're using it, and we believe that it's one of the most powerful methods we can use to, to engage this problem. OK, so how do, we, how do we use this? The particular flavor of deep neural networks we're using are autoencoding networks, or so-called autoencoders. So what are these? It's an unsupervised machine learning technique. So what are we passing to the input layer? We're passing atomic configurations. We've done a little molecular simulation. We know what the molecule looks like. We have its Cartesian coordinates as a function of time. And we ask the neural network, can you find good low dimensional collective variables with which to describe the dynamics of the system? So how do we do that? Well, we design a neural network architecture with this autoencoding topology. So here's your input coordinates. Here's your so-called hidden layer that's actually doing the computation, your encoding. 
And here's your bottleneck layer. So here's the low dimensional latent space you're trying to learn. So, okay, if you, were, if you knew the collective variables a priori, you could just train the encoder to do that. But of course, that's a problem we're trying to solve. We don't know what these collective variables are. So how can we discover them? Well, you strap on a decoder that says, take these collective variables and try and reconstruct your atomic coordinates that you started with. So the input and the output in the ideal case should be the same. So what are you asking the network to do? You're saying, can you take my high dimensional atomic coordinate, discover a low dimensional representation from which I can reconstruct my atomic coordinates with high fidelity. If you can train the network to do this, you know you've discovered a good low dimensional representation. And this low dimensional representation is exactly the collective variables that we want to use to do our sampling, because it tells you you can preserve most of the dynamical information about the system in this low dimensional latent space. Okay, so that's good. Um, and why is it explicit and differentiable? Well, a neural network is nothing more than a bunch of sort of uh, weighted sums of inputs passed uh, from one layer to the next, uh, sort of uh, modulated with some uh, nonlinear activation functions. So all of this math is explicit. So I can write down an explicit mathematical expression relating this collective variables to the input atomic coordinates. And guess what? The way you train your neural network is by gradient descent, back propagation. So you have the gradients for free. So you have your biasing forces automatically. Okay, so unsupervised learning, trying to find a low dimensional latent space representation that's explicit and differentiable. Okay, so here we're actually specializing to molecular simulations. So here you have some configurations of your molecular system. The encoding layer is taking you from your high dimensional space to your low dimensional representation. Your decoding layer is taking you from your low dimensional representation back to your high dimensional space. So we perform training using the encoder <coughs> and the decoder. Once you've trained your network and you've found your latent space representation, you can throw away the decoder. You don't need that anymore. All you need is the encoder, the mathematical transformation that goes from the input to the, to the bottleneck layer. So how do we train these things? And so we just use standard back propagation algorithm. And so basically we're just trying to minimize the reconstruction error subject to some regularization. So here we have the reconstruction error. And so this is your uh, input coordinates of your atomic system. Here's your reconstructed coordinates, and so more explicitly, you run your input configuration through the encoder back through the decoder, see how well you approximate your input, take the L2 norm, that's your reconstruction error. We'd also like to stabilize fitting by applying a regularization term, so this is just a so-called weight decay, so this is just providing sort of a penalty on having very large weights in your network, which is basically just the parameters of the network. You're trying to regularize those towards small values to improve the robustness of your fitting. How do we fit this? We actually use uh, sort of a variant of cross-validation. So it's a little bit fancier than that, but basically we just split our data set into training and testing sets, and we terminate training <coughs> when the, the testing errors uh, reaches its minimum. Okay, so that's how we train our network. And so, so we, we collect a small amount of molecular simulation data, we train our network, that gives us an initial guess for our collective variables. Um, how do we specify the dimensionality of the system? So a priori, we don't know what the dimensionality is going to be. And so we know it's going to be something relatively low. So for all molecular simulations, uh, molecular systems that I've ever studied, the dimensionality has always be, been between around 2 and 7. So it just seems that natural proteins are arranged to be low dimensional. Perhaps you can speculate that in order to do some evolutionary useful work, you need to populate a low dimensional manifold. But empirical data suggests that you're relatively low dimensional, but, but we don't know how low dimensional. So how do we figure that out? So we do that again by cross-validation. And so we train a bunch of autoencoders with different numbers of bottleneck uh, nodes. And so this is a two-dimensional latent space. If you have a third node here, that's a three-dimensional latent space. We train two, three, four, five, six, seven. And we ask, how does the fidelity of your reconstruction in the output layer depend on the dimensionality of your bottleneck layer? So this curve here is basically showing the fraction of variance explained um, as a function of the number of nodes in your bottleneck layer. So if you only have one node, you get about 70%. If you have two nodes, you have about 80%. If you have three nodes, you have about 90%. And then you asymptote. So in this case, we would say about three nodes is the right amount. That's the knee in this curve. So you probably have a three-dimensional latent space. So this is a systematic way of analyzing the data to tell you your, your intrinsic dimensionality. OK. All right, so then we train our network. It seems to go pretty well. So then how do we actually implement the bias? And so here we apply our bias generically through sort of an artificial potential. So here's the probability of a particular molecular configuration. So the Boltzmann distribution is, is typically the, the distribution that we care about. So here, are, this is the energy of the system. 
And so the energy is composed of sort of your unbiased Hamiltonian, so that's the, the natural force field for your system. This is whatever Amber or Charm or Gromax tells you that the, the, the force field is. And here's our artificial potential. So we write down our artificial potential, this biasing potential V, as a function of our collective variables, which themselves are a function of the atomic coordinates. So these CVs are explicit and differentiable functions of the atomic coordinates. That's why we used autoencoders in the beginning. So if you're running Monte Carlo simulations, you can write down the energy as a function of the unbiased Hamiltonian and the biasing potential. If you're running molecular dynamic simulations, you can take first derivatives and write down your forces as a function of unbiased forces that come out of your molecular simulation engine and your biasing forces that you can explicitly write down as a function of your collective variables. So this is how we're pushing our simulation around the collective variable space in collective variables that we've discerned directly from the data. So we've asked the system to tell us good collective variables, and then we exploit those collective variables to enhance sampling. OK, so this is good. So what, what's the problem? So the problem is you have a bit of a chicken and an egg problem. You need good sampling of your configurational phase space to get good collective variables. But you need good collective variables to get good sampling of your configurational phase space. So what do you do? And so you use some sort of bootstrapped iterative technique. And so the idea is that you sort of interleave simulation and biasing. So you do a short unbiased simulation. You don't do a very good job of populating your phase space, but you learn some reasonable collective variables with which to drive your system using these biasing potentials. You drive your system. You do a bit better job of populating the space. You then learn even better variables. You drive in those variables, et cetera, et cetera, until you converge. So this idea of sort of interleaving sampling um, and learning is sort of the, the, sort of, uh, the, the sort of iterative paradigm that, that we're going to exploit. So online biasing using the, uh, the, the learned collective variables, offline learning to learn better collective variables each time. So this might look something like this block diagram. So in iteration zero, maybe you run an unbiased molecular dynamic simulation. You train an autoencoder to learn some variables. You do some biasing in those variables. You expand your phase space surge. You then perform some umbrella sampling here to expand out your, your regime of sampling. Learn new phase space variables. So you're pushing out to a larger uh, portion of space, larger and larger. And then you terminate when you stop, when you get diminishing returns, basically, when your collective variables stabilize and you stop uh, enlarging your, your, your sampled region of phase space. OK, so let me uh, describe for you a couple of examples. I'm just going to talk about the first one and the third one. So the first one is alanine dipeptides, so sort of the hydrogen atom of protein folding. Super simple system. We understand it very, very well. Let's use this as a test case for, for our algorithm. OK, so here we are. So, so we, we did exactly what I described. And so, so let me show you the real data for this. And so the last uh, flow diagram I showed you was just a block diagram. Here's the actual data. OK, so what am I showing you? So the first column is basically the collective variables learned by our autoencoder, C1 and C2, as a function of three different iterations. This is iteration one, three, and five. So here we're projecting the data that we get from an initial unbiased simulation of our molecule into these two collective variables the first autoencoder has learned. I'm coloring these by the phi angle of the, the backbone dihedral. So it turns out dialanine is not terribly important. It's well described by the phi and psi backbone dihedrals. We know those are good collective variables. So can the autoencoder learn that and use those to accelerate sampling? So here we've colored the data by the phi angle. Here's exactly the same plot where the data has been colored by the psi angle. And here's the Ramachandran plot when I'm just projecting the data from this initial unbiased simulation into phi psi space. So we're restricted to sample this upper left corner of the diagram. We'd really like to sample this whole surface. OK, the blue crosses are where we initialize our first round of bias simulations. This is where we say, OK, these are anchor points where we'd like to apply harmonic biasing potentials to push the simulation out to sample these new points. So we're trying to expand the region over which we, we do our sampling. So by iteration three, we've been reasonably successful. We've pushed out this region of sampling out a little bit further. So this is populating a larger region of our collective variable space. You can even see in the Ramachandran plot, we've now sort of populated this entire left column. So, so things seem to be going reasonably well. But as you see between iteration one, three, and five, things are changing all the time. These collective variables are not the same between each iteration. So we've not yet converged. And certainly the region of sampled space is changing, telling us we've not done a good job of fully sampling the phase space. Iteration seven is the same, but then between iteration nine and iteration 10, we see actually some convergence. So it turns out that the collective variables discovered in iteration nine and iteration 10 are identical up to a sign flip. And so it turns out if you just flip the signs of this, uh, this manifold here, you get this manifold right here. So you just flip it this way, flip it this way. You can even see that these things look the same. So our collective variables have stabilized. Also, the region of the manifold that we populate, even though we try and bias to push it out further, it doesn't go any further. We've sort of reached 
um, the, the limits of thermal sampling. And so we've sampled the phase space uh, sort of comprehensively, and so we should believe that we should get some nice converged averages. So you can also see this in the Ramachandran plot, and so you can see that there's no expansion in training between this iteration and this iteration. So, so we sort of say that we, we've done a good job of sampling, and then we find our free energy landscape, and it turns out this free energy landscape is in quantitative agreement with the one that you would have gotten if you just run unbiased simulations for a very long period of time. So because we can do that for the alanine, we know the gold standard answer, and we can verify that our technique actually got the right answer. Okay, so, so why should you care? Well, what's the advantage? Well, the fact is we can do it very, very quickly without knowing any a priori information about the system. So this algorithm I just described figured out what the important collective variables were, figured out what the dimensionality of the system was, figured out how to do bias sampling in that space, and did it all very, very rapidly within 22 CPU minutes, whereas this would require orders of magnitude longer simulation to do this using biasing techniques, uh, excuse me, using unbiased techniques. Okay, so then you might say, well, why don't I just use metadynamics or my favorite bias simulation technique? In this case, you could do that because you know the collective variables, <coughs> but our methodology is able to discover the collective variables for you. So for systems, when you don't have that prior knowledge, this is of great value. Okay, so that was for, um, for uh, alanine dipeptide. So a super, super simple example. So what about something a little fancier? Um, so we think this is a little fancier, you may not agree, but the reason it's a little fancier is because we're trying to directly engage solvent coordinates. This is some work that we're doing with Amish Patel at uh, University of Pennsylvania. And so the problem is the following. A lot of protein folding really depends very heavily on what the solvent is doing. You can't just focus directly on what the protein atoms are doing. Hydrophobic effect is the main drivers of protein structure and function. Okay, so we know that. So that tells us that when we're doing these learning techniques, we should really be engaging solvent coordinates directly. So we said, okay, protein folding is difficult. We'll build up to that. Let's start with something simple. Let's start with a hydrophobic polymer chain and ask if we can use these autoencoding neural networks to tell us, well, what are the important solvent variables we should worry about? And how should we bias on the solvent coordinates to help us understand how the system is folding and ultimately how we can then accelerate sampling? Okay, so this is an example of the folding of a, of a polymer chain. So it's just simple C24 alkane, it's living in water. This bubble around it is just the uh, solvent excluded volume. And so you can see it starts to fold up, it makes this kink in its head, the solvent bubble grows to encompass the entire chain. This sort of solvent excluded volume stabilizes this collapsed configuration. You'll see in a moment that the solvent bubble then breaks and, and, the, and the sort of uh, molecule then extends back out to, to an extended state. So we know that solvent is really, really important in understanding the dynamics and the thermodynamics of this system. So can we sort of engage that question using autoencoders? Okay, so, so let's step back for a second and say, well, what about if you don't care about the solvent? Let's just learn over the solute coordinates. So let's learn over exactly what we did before for dialanine. Just worry about the carbon atom coordinates of this polymer chain. So you can do that. I explained to you exactly how we do that. So here's our autoencoder. Here's our atomic coordinates. Here's our reconstructed atomic coordinates. Here's our latent space. And we learn this latent space representation that we can then use for biasing. Okay, so it turns out this guy is two-dimensional. So the fraction of variance explained curve tells us we're two-dimensional. Here's our first variable. Here's our second variable. Here's the embedding of our data points into this low dimensional space. And I've colored them according to the first principal moment of the gyration tensor, which is just telling you how long the chain is. So here we have the all trans chain. Here we have the helically collapsed chain that's living in a solvent bubble. And here we have some intermediate configuration. And what we note from this plot is there's this big hole in the middle. So, so what is this? So it tells us that as this chain is collapsing, it's not collapsing like this. It's collapsing like I showed you in the movie by making a kink in either the head or the tail. And the, the, the chain then slides down and collapses. So why is it doing that? It turns out that in order to collapse like this, requires a collective expulsion of solvent molecules. That's free energetically very costly. It's much cheaper from a thermodynamic perspective to push them out one by one. And so the, uh, the autoencoder was able to learn that. It tells us that this is the collapse pathway to go around the outside. Um, okay, so what about the second variable? So the second variable, C2, that was discovered by the autoencoder, so this guy right here, is well correlated with the vertical shift of the ends of the chain. So it tells you whether you have a kink in the head or whether you have a kink in the tail. Okay, so these are good variables with which to describe the system, good variables with which to accelerate the system. So you could accelerate along this first mode or along the second mode, and things go, things go reasonably well. So these are good solute acceleration variables. All right, so I said that the purpose of this was to try and engage the solvent. So how do we do that? So let's pretend we don't know anything about the solute. We don't have the solute coordinates. So all we can engage is the solvent. Can we learn something about the dynamics of the system? And how well, how far does that get us to describing the chain collapse dynamics? 
So how does one do this? So maybe you just plug into your Austrian encoder the coordinates of all of the solvent molecules. So it turns out that's a terrible idea. So why? Because there are n solvent molecules and they're all identical. And so you have this n factorial relabeling problem. So all relabelings of your solvent molecules do not change the state of your system. There's a symmetry that you need to engage. So we don't want the autoencoder just to learn that solvent molecule 1 should be over here and solvent molecule 12 should be over here, whereas if you exchange them, the state of the system doesn't change. So you need to do something that mods out that symmetry. So what do we do? So we use some tricks taught to us by, by Amish Patel, which says, well, let's draw a little spherical volume around each one of these solute atoms and count how many solvent molecules live inside there. So we actually use a smoothed count so we don't get any discontinuities from sort of solvent molecules passing over this boundary. But basically, it's a, it's a smooth number of counts of solvent molecules molecules in the vicinity of each solute atom. How big do we set the volume of the sphere? Well, basically, we pick the uh, sort of uh, first trough in the pair correlation function. So this is where the solvent molecules are sort of moving in and out of the hydration shell. OK, so then we count the solvent molecules inside each one of these little spheres, and we pass that to our autoencoder. We then ask the autoencoder to reconstruct these solvent counts. So this is a pure solvent autoencoder. OK, so what happens? And so we learn the following collective variables. So these zeta 1 and zeta 2 are the solvent collective variables. And we can project our data into the solvent collective coordinates. And how do things look? So it turns out we get very similar manifolds. It's, first of all, it's two-dimensional. And the, the two uh, dimensions that we get are very close to the ones that we got from the solute collective coordinates. So this first one here, zeta 1, is basically correlated with the sum of the solvent counts. And so the sigma is just the sum of the number of solvent molecules in all of these spherical volumes. And so this guy is basically, you can think about, as being wet. And so this is an elongated configuration where all the solute molecules can get very close to the chain. This guy here is very dry. Why is it dry? Because it's hydrophobically collapsed. And so the autoencoder learned this is the first important mode, basically how wet or dry the chain is. What about the second mode, the zeta 2? So this basically corresponds again to this delta. And so this is how uh, kink the chain is, whether there's a kink at the head or a kink in the tail. But of course, the autoencoder doesn't know anything about kinks in the solute. So how does it represent that? It basically represents them as basically whether the head is dry or the tail is dry. So in this case, the head is going to be wet and the tail is going to be dry. And in this case, the head is going to be dry and the tail is going to be wet. And so it basically learned that whether the kink is in the head or the tail, i.e. the hydrophobic collapse has occurred at the head or the tail of the molecule. So basically, we, we get, I'm not sure whether it's quite bijective, but we get similar information content about the folding process from the solvent coordinates. Moreover, we can then bias directly in the solvent coordinates and ask if we can accelerate our sampling. So here we go. I'm biasing in the first coordinate, zeta 1. And so when we uh, bias zeta 1 to be towards the left-hand side of the diagram, things are pretty wet. And so I've not pushed out much of the solvent molecules. As you apply stronger and stronger biasing potentials, you're causing de-wetting of the solvent away from your chain. So what is this doing? It's basically building a, sol a solvent bubble around your chain. And by doing that, you enhance sampling. So here, we're restricted to very elongated chains that are very wet. By the time we get over here, we're sort of oscillating freely between elongated and collapsed chains. Why? Because I basically removed the chain to the ideal gas. And so now there are no solvent molecules around to sort of prevent collapse or extension happening. And the chain is very happily sampling in and out of the collapse configurations. So this is a different way of accelerating the system by modulating the solvent coordinates. Um, OK, so how about if I sample not in the horizontal direction, but in the vertical direction? So can I make the chain kink in the head and the tail? And the answer is yes. And so if I move towards sort of the bottom of the diagram, I can make the head dry by pushing the solvent molecules out and keep the tail wet. If I push up to the top of the diagram, I can do the inverse. And this induces chain collapse by um, either one of those pathways, head kinking or tail kinking. Um, OK, so both of these are ways of accelerating your dynamics using the solvent alone. So this is just proof of principle. It's sort of a relatively simplistic example. And of course, we would like to combine both the solvent and the solute, because coupling between these things is likely to be very important um, in sort of real proteins. When these things are, are not uh, happening in isolation, you have solute and solvent talking to one another. Um, and we'd like to apply it, obviously, to more interesting systems than a, a simple hydrophobic polymer. So systems that are very difficult to sample, perhaps proteins with bound water molecules, where biasing on the protein alone is not going to get you uh, good sampling. You need to also bias on the solvent. Um, OK, so all of this stuff is uh, freely available on GitHub. And so, uh, so my students sort of implemented all this as, as plugins to OpenMM. And we're also working with the developers of uh, Plumed, the enhanced <laughs> sampling suite, to sort of bake this into the, 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 the Plumed libraries. And so it should be very easy to sort of uh, use these techniques w within your own molecular simulations if this is something you at all care about.
Um, and so ongoing work, uh, so the first part of the talk, and so like I said, we're doing inverse design of the diamond lattice. Um, everything I told you today was engineering colloidal level systems. We'd also like to engineer sort of molecular level sim systems. So how do you design a peptide to have particular self-assembly properties to make sort of uh, elongated sort of bioelectronics uh, that are sort of biocompatible? Um, and ultimately sort of uh, uh, complementing our, our, uh, our computation with some experimental synthesis. And so can we actually use this engine to try and direct experimental synthesis towards promising design? Um, second part of the talk, again, like I mentioned, coupled solute, solvent extraction, applying it to sort of more interesting proteins, sort of allosteric transitions in large proteins where, where a sampling is very difficult. And we think this methodology can really ameliorate the difficulty and, and sort of reduce the amount of computational effort one needs to go to. Um, and then using these uh, latent space representations to design uh, generalized Langevin equations or Markov state models to try and improve sampling by sort of running the dynamics within the latent space and then projecting back up to your high dimensional atomic space. Um, okay, so with that, I'd just like to uh, thank the funding sources, and so, so um, this has been uh, largely supported by uh, NSF um, and Department of Energy and the folks that did the work, and so in the first part of the talk on the landscape engineering, that was uh, Andy Long, who's now a data scientist at 3M, uh, Yu Tao Ma, who's, who's with me in Chicago, and the second part of the wa uh, work was done by my, uh, my student, uh, Wei Chen. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention and take any questions that, that you might have. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a good question. So if, you're, if you do have disjoint regions and your variance in the design of your candidates is not sufficiently broad, then you will have difficulty finding that for sure. So I guess we're appealing to concepts of sort of smoothness and locality. And so in the design variables we've picked so far, those are smooth, continuous variables. So in this case, it was a stickiness, so an energy, and it was um, an, an angle of the patch. Okay. It becomes way more difficult if you're in a discontinuous space. So I'm thinking sort of molecular space, where your, your, your sort of design variable is a smile string or something like this. And in that case, I think you have uh, big concerns about your, your disconnectivity. Um, yeah, I think it's a great point. So the, the algorithm that we use is pretty robust for these relatively smooth spaces. I think we, we use covariance matrix adaptation, um, ES, evolutionary strategy. For disconnected spaces, I think other things may be more appropriate. Okay. So you know that for that particular example, it's best works? We think it's okay for this, yeah. But I think you know, things are like uh, Alana Sparoguzic, where he's about, he has some fancier algorithms that for chemical space that I think we could appeal to. So when you talked about using solvent counts in order to get rid of the permutation difficulty, that implies to me that you can't go back and generate a configuration based off of those learned co collected variables anymore. Is that a hindrance in practice, or are there ways around that? Yeah, so that's a great point. Uh, Andrew, can you repeat the question for the sure. video? So the, so the question was, uh, when you use solvent counts rather than solvent coordinates, does that mean that you no longer can represent um, rigorously the, the, the high dimensional state of the system? And the answer is yes, and so, so that's absolutely true. So what you then have is a statistical dependence. There are multiple realizations of your high dimensional system that are consistent with your low dimensional embedding, if you like. So I guess the way you can think about it, or at least the, the way that I find useful to think about it, is that we've um, sort of added an extra layer here, if you like, that we've gone from our atomic configuration and, and sort of by fiat, we've, we've sort of coarse grained that into counts. And that's what we pass to the neural network. And so the neural network doesn't know anything about the configurational space anymore. And so there are multiple realizations that are consistent with that, but that's okay because the, the solvent configurations that are consistent with your low dimensional projection are the ones that you care about. And so if you care about this in a statistical sense rather than a bijective sense, I think that's okay. So if you are really worried about, okay, I think that the positions of the molecules and exactly how far they are from the, uh, the solute atoms ra rather than just their coarse grain counts are important, then you would have to do something coordinate based. And um, there's work by Wynan E at Princeton who, who use similar, uh, similar descriptions to that. So they actually use a very nice trick, which is that I talked about the fungibility problem, this n factorial relabeling. All they do is look out to a certain distance and order the solvent molecules 
um, according to distance. And so the first molecule you present to your autoencoder is the closest one, the next one is the next closest one, and so you always have the correct ordering, at least in distance space, um, in the way that you present them. And that seems to work reasonably well. Well, thank you very much, Andrea. Thanks.